So good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the water quality and treatment groundwater for household use. Um, if you guys have any questions that come up during the presentation, I would gladly ask that you type them into the chat and we'll go over them at the end of the presentation. Um, other than that, I guess I'll just turn it over to Sean and he can introduce himself. Good evening. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Sean Elgert, Agricultural Water Engineer with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. I'm in Barhead here. Um, I didn't have to travel two and three quarters hours up to Bonneville, which is a little nice, but uh, it's good to be with you here this evening, especially in these times. I'll be talking about water quality and treatment for groundwater for household usage. Um, so I'll be talking about the common problems for groundwater quality and treatment, and it's going to be for household use only. This is for drinking water and laundering, bathing, et cetera, uh, but not for surface water sources. Um, that is more involved, surface water sources. And I hope to have time at the end. Um, it's, I'm going to have to talk a little quickly, but I'm, I hope to talk briefly on groundwater under the direct influence of surface water, which uh, we use the acronym GUDI for that. Um, as far as the quality of our groundwater goes, a higher percentage uh, of reported waterborne disease outbreaks for human drinking water came from private water supplies as compared to municipal and other sources. So there are challenges for small systems, particularly rural private residential supplies. Um, Alberta Health and Wellness has studied water quality and treatment systems for the province, and um, some analysis and studies have been done by some counties as well. According to a survey, 63% of the rural population believe they have been sold treatment systems that do not work. And with all the calls I've taken, I would have to agree it's a fairly high number. Um, devices and processes aren't often adapted to low flow needs or to specific for rural lives. Treatment will cost up to seven times more for rural people than for urban people. This is due to the economies of scale. So here's some of the um, common important parameters for analysis. I'll just list them here and go over most of them later. Nitrate, pH, sodium, chloride, fluoride, sulfate, iron, manganese, total dissolved solids, hardness, and for the biological uh, organisms, E. coli, and more generally, total coliforms. For rural domestic usage, you can contact a local health unit and they um, uh, provide free sampling in some places, um, they may charge a courier fee. Or you can go to a private lab. Um, Alberta Health Unit has been testing heavy metals for over a year now. Uh, and sometimes if you have a known problem, this will require special testing. Uh, in, within the Canadian Water Quality Guidelines, there are health-related related guidelines called Maximum Acceptable Concentrations, or MAC, um, the acronym is, and this you may see on the lab analysis and wondering what a MAC is. There are also aesthetic objectives, or the acronym is AO, and these involve taste, staining, scaling, odor, and color, non-related health, non-health related guidelines. There are also guidelines available on Health Canada's website, both summary and detailed, as well as supporting doc, tech, technical documents because one rule or number, as they say, doesn't always fit every situation. So it is, it is important to look at the supporting technical documents. I just wanna talk a little bit about larger numbers versus smaller numbers in water quality levels. Um, uh, you know, just because you have a large number in your water quality parameter doesn't mean that it's bad or just because you have a low number doesn't mean it's good. For example, you can have 400 milligrams per liter of sulfate which is 80% of the aesthetic objective, so not a health-related guideline, that's not nearly as bad as one milligram per liter of lead or arsenic, which is 10 times the health-related guideline. So I wanna, I wanna talk to you a little bit about uh, the Rural Water Quality Information Tool, which is an online tool. Um, you can, uh, this, uh, this will help you understand your water quality analysis, and it's an interactive tool um, that you can input your lab results into as well as provides general inform information for water suitability analysis. It provides unbiased, credible advice in a consistent manner because various professionals, um, not only in Alberta, but in other provinces were involved in its creation. It, um, if you wanna take a quick picture of the web address, I'll just leave a few moments for you to do that. But you can also just uh, 
you know, search for the Rural Water Quality Information Tool, or, or you can contact me later if you want. Um, we'll see how that goes. So this uh, tool assesses the suitability for human drinking, uh, as well as main agricultural uses, in a, um, which includes a bit of irrigation. Uh, it compares analysis levels to federal guidelines and the best available information where there are no guidelines. It, it provides sampling and testing information and a little bit about treatment information because it's such a vast uh, subject. It uses road signals um, to tell you, you know, how the water is at a glance, visual glance. So it is red if it's above the guideline, yellow if it's within 80% of the guideline, and green if it's okay. And it also has a question mark for where there is no guideline. It also has a bibliography. Here's a snapshot of the tool. You have to accept the disclaimer, that gray button in the middle of the tool. And also, there's links to tell you how to use it and the key features as well. And here's the report that is generated by the tool. You can also save it, save it as a PDF. It's easier to view. But this is just to give you an idea of what it looks like when you finish with the tool. So I just want to start talking about the first parameter, um, starting with the parameters. Total dissolved solids is a composite of all the dissolved solids within the water. Uh, the aesthetic objective is 500 milligrams per liter, and this is for taste and operational considerations. So it may have a metallic or salty taste, uh, corrosive or scaling uh, problems, and it can potentially cause problems for distribution and treatment systems. Just for an example, it can give you an idea whether a booster pump may be required to boost the pressure for a reverse osmosis system if, it, if the TDS is high. Um, you should know what the ions are that make up total dissolved solids, um, and then you treat for those specific ions. You don't just treat for total dissolved solids in general. Uh, total dissolved solids comes from both mat natural and man-made sources. Salts are the major um, minerals that make up total dissolved solids. As water flows through the aquifers, it dissolves minerals in the soil and rock formations and picks up the salt. And man-made activity can also be responsible, such as road salts and fertilizers. Some are corrosive and some cause scaling. So, there's so there are soft water salts and there are hard water salts, but most people, when they talk about soft water, uh, when they talk about salts, they talk about soft water salts, and that's what I'm going to be re uh, using the word salts for here. So the soft water salts, uh, a lot of soft water salts and groundwater are sulfate salts. And in general, they produce a laxative effect. Sodium sulfate, or what they call, call globers salt, um, it has the most the, or the highest laxative effect. It tastes bad, and the high sodium is not good for the heart. And it can also reduce uptake of, of nutrients. Magnesium sulfate is the main ingredient in, in Epsom salt, so it's nice to bathe in. And a sodium a chloride, which is similar to table salt, also occurs in grain, groundwater. So as far as the treatment goes for these salts, reverse osmosis is one of the main treatments. But you shouldn't have iron or hardness or sediment in the, in the raw water. Um, but if you do, you could pre-treat it. So it might require pre-treatment. Some people don't realize that, and they plug their reverse osmosis membranes. Uh, so the pore sides are so small, or just the right size um, in the membrane filter, so they uh, filter out the larger salt molecules, but they let the pure, smaller water molecules go through. About 85 to 98 percent of salt is rejected, depending on the type of RO filter and the level of salt. So, uh, I mean, you can have such high levels of salt that 75 to 95 percent of rejected water can go to waste in rural settings, depending on the, the water, raw water quality. Distillation is another method of treatment for salts. The distillate is essentially pure unless the boiler element is fouled or float valve stick. So you have to make sure that you know, you're maintaining um, and monitoring your distiller um, every so often. And cost and maintenance are the main draw drawbacks here. It, takes, it can take quite a bit to you know, clean the distiller and to, for the, the heat and whatnot to distill the water. Moving on to hardness, this is essentially calcium and, mag and magnesium carbonates that precipitate out, out of the water. So when you pump water out of the well, you reduce the pressure, increase the temperature, and drive the chemical reaction to preci precipitate the hardness out. This, is, this causes scaling, and you need more soap to clean the water. 
you, you hope to have about 80 to 100 milligrams per liter of hardness. That's a good, those are good levels. Between 200, two, excuse me, 200 and 500 is aesthetically poor, but can be tolerated. Um, above, high, above 500 milligrams per liter is generally considered unacceptable. However, I've seen levels quite a bit higher than this that people are trying to treat and they get sludge in some of their treatment systems and they have to replace the media more often, but it can be done. Um, if you feel that squeaky clean feeling, that's actually soap scum. It's not a feeling of clean, cleanliness. It's a feeling of the hardness reacting with the soap in the water. So the treatment, so the, the main treatment is ion exchange or what we call a softener. This replaces the calcium, calcium and magnesium ions with sodium or potassium. And back flushing, um, so you flush all, the, all of those precipitated ions or the, ion, the calcium and magnesium ions um, is required and it, it needs a regeneration with salt periodically. Another system that can work is distillation, but it's costly and high maintenance, especially when hardness is present. Um, I know I, I grew up with a distiller like that and it was, it was always a chore to deal with. So you don't want, I mean, you maybe we treating mainly for soft water, but if you have a, some hard water in it, it could it could work. Nanofiltration, um, you know, these the, this is like reverse osmosis, but it has higher membrane pores in it. It can work, but the membranes membranes may get scaled up unless the water is pre-treated to keep the hardness elements in a dissolved state. That is done in some treatment systems. Iron is another problem. The scales um, the scale clogs up some treatment systems, pipes, hot water tanks. Stains, it stains fixtures and laundry. Um, you can get pink clothing coming out at times. Um, so you, you can get that rust color stain, staining on your fixtures as well. Even if you have a small amount, around 0.3 milligrams per liter, this can lead to biofouling of the well and it can cause increased staining. So the, the, there's this natural bacteria not health related that can increase the staining of, of small amounts of iron. And at times it can come from the well casing. But generally not a whole lot and it's often not the problem. Uh, so if your well casing was corroding on you. Uh, there are generally two main types of iron. There's the dissolved iron called ferrous iron and the precipitated iron called ferric iron. Um, in the water well column within the well is generally the dissolved iron and some precipitated iron may sink to the bottom. There are some forms of iron that are colloidal or organically bound that can be harder to remove. I'll, I'll t give you a little tips about that coming here. Um, manganese um, is similar to iron, and I'm, I'm going to talk about the treatment for both of these here together. Uh, or Sorry, I think I did already, um, but for iron. But it's similar to iron uh, for treatment. However, manganese can have a health effect. Um, this we learned not too long ago that manganese can have a health effect. But the, the um, health level, uh, guideline level is higher than the aesthetic level. So the health guideline for manganese is 0.12 milligrams per liter. They, they established that guideline in 2019, not long ago. And the aesthetic objective is about six times lower at 0.02 milligrams per liter. Uh, I mean, you can get a gray or darker stain occurring from manganese. So here, here's the uh, slide for treatment of iron and manganese. Um, you can use chemical oxidation and filtration. So um, one example of chemical op oxidation and physical filtration is an iron filter. This is the most tried and true uh, method for the treatment of iron and manganese. It uses a bead media called manganese green sand. Um, and so the, when the, the iron and manganese is precipitated out, it adheres onto these beads. And it's recharged by one of the most powerful oxidants in water treatment, which is potassium permanganate. Um, and so you re every so often you need to flush the precipitate out and recharge it with this uh, uh, oxidant. You need to have sure you have enough flow rate from your well to do a back flush. Um, if you don't, a cistern may need be needed so you know you can draw from the cistern and not directly from the well because you could cause damage to your well if you pump it too hard. A softener may be used um, as a, another system here. 
uh, for the treatment of iron in some cases. Generally, in the past, we've said if it's below two milligrams per liter. However, there are new softeners coming out that can handle higher levels, and there's different types of soft as to what level that can be treated at. Chlorination with bead media can also be used. So instead of the iron filter using potassium permanganate, it uses um, chlor chlorine as the oxidant. It's not as powerful as an oxidant. And oxygen can also be used as an oxidant. Again, it's even weaker than chlorine. That's only if the iron is re easily removed. So talking about that, you can sort of get an idea of how easily the iron is going to be removed, hopefully ahead of time, by doing jar tests. So you take three jars, you put you take you put clean the raw water in clean jars, and in the first jar you beat it up with a fork, oxygen into the water with a fork. The next one you put five drops of chlorine in the jar, you stir that around, and the next one 30 drops. And you monitor this over a period of time to see how quickly they precipitate out and how readily they precipitate out, and also the colors of what's precipitating out. Is it rusty color? Is it a gray or dark color? And manganese is generally harder to remove than iron. They can plug up membrane filters or other treatment systems as well. Uh, moving on to hydrogen sulfide gas. Uh, this gives off a rotten egg odor. You should hopefully know what the difference between a rotten egg odor and a septic odor is. But this uh, gas is noticeable at very low concentrations and it's generally not necessary to test for it in most cases unless it's very high because if it's higher then you want to know what that level is because some systems may not be able to remove the higher levels of H2S. H2S can be created by bacteria in the aquifer or water well. It can also be created in the hot water tank by a chemical reaction with the water and the sacrificial anode. So it can help to troubleshoot um, you know, what the problem is or where it's coming from. Um, so is the smell coming from the cold water or the hot water? If it's, if it's a fairly you know, stronger level, if it's only coming from the hot water, it might be only generated from the hot water tank. But if it's a lower level, sometimes you know, the hot water can warm up the H2S gas if it comes even from the well. So it's a little harder to tell if it's at a lower level. Uh, so one of the treatments for H2S gas is spray aeration. So you spray the water, the raw water into a tank. This allows the H2S molecule of gas to travel a shorter distance to escape out of the water. And that gas, the H2S has to be vented outside. Um, and then you can follow up with a chlorine injection, injection system when there are higher concentrations of the gas. Because generally, if, if you have higher levels, a spray aeration will probably leave some of the gas inside. So you can polish it up with the chlorine. And then after that, you can follow it up with a chlorine filter to remove any excess gas or chlorine. But it's better to have excess uh, chlorine than gas because the gas will burn quicker through your carbon filter because you do have to re replace that carbon filter every so often, depending on you know what's going through it. Another uh, standalone system is a chlorination system. Uh, this is most often used when your levels are above six milligrams per liter of H2S. Um, I should just say about the spray aeration, I like the idea that it doesn't use chemicals. And if you have higher levels, you can start with that and then follow up with the chlorine. But you can use the chlorine as a standalone treatment system as well. But the pH should be, be between six and eight. So the chlorine oxidizes H2S to an insoluble sulfide, depending on the type of chlorine used. Um, and this goes for every oxidant. It, it oxidizes, these, oxidizes the gas to uh, an insoluble sulfide. So that precipitate, you need, in this case, you need to filter it out or settle it out in a tank and then flush the tank. Continuing with the chlorination system, as I mentioned, you follow up with the carbon filter. Uh, sorry, I'll, I guess I mentioned the preferring the excess chlorine and not the issue gas, S gas here. Um, if iron is present, you need to filter that out before it hits the carbon filter because that can plug the carbon filter. If you have organics present, which is dissolved organic co co um, content, uh, which is in some lab tests, they're called tannins and lignans. It depends on the lab test or it could be called DOC. If that's present, this can create disinfection products that have a statistical link to cancer for long-term consumption. And um, so you want to be, you know, making sure you don't have those. 
sorry, I just want to back up one time. Yeah, so and so a carbon filter can remove it as long as it's you know fresh and it's not exhausted. The carbon filter can remove these disinfection byproducts. Um, so another treatment for H2S is an iron filter, um, the same type of type of iron filter. This that as I talked about before, uh, but this in this case is best used if it's mainly treating for iron. If you have iron there but with a little bit of H2S. So, you know, under two milligrams per liter of H2S because it, uh, the oxidant potassium permanganate is expensive and it'll, that H2S gas will burn through it quickly. Um, so, so as I mentioned, this uh, system is recharged with potassium permanganate, but there are no harmful disinfection byproducts uh, produced if you're using that oxidant, if tannins and lignans are present. So that's, that's a good thing. So just moving on to arsenic, um, the, there is a the maximum acceptable concentration is 0 0.01 milligrams per liter, or 10 micrograms per liter. That was changed in 2007 from 0 0.025, so two and a half times differential, um, and, and that's a quite a low number if you look at other parameters. Um, arsenic three is more difficult, and arsenic three we call arsenite, and arsenic five arsenate. Arsenic three is more difficult to remove than arsenic five as it's neutral and charge. Generally, if you have a neutral charge as opposed to charge, it's, it's harder to remove the neutral charge element. Uh, also, arsenic-3 is a lot more toxic than arsenic-5. It can be about 60 times more toxic. Um, oxidant, oxidizing agents, um, for example, chlorine are used to change arsenic-3 into arsenic-5, um, so it is easier to remove. That's pr a pretreatment. Um, so when you're testing for arsenic, you should test for uh, competing ions also, and silica and organic matter, because this will also re react with the chlorine, and you may need to up your chlorine level, so there's enough chlorine le uh, left over to treat the arsenic. And you can also contact a relevant professional for treatment advice. In the Bonneville area, uh, arsenic levels are about 10 times higher than arsenic-5. Um, so, uh, you know, there's more care needed to treat. Um, and arsenate, if you think about the words arsenate and arsenite, arsenate is more oxygenated. That might help you to remember the terms. So within the province of Alberta, some of the areas that have arsenic are Slave Lake, Cold Lake Bonneville, Spruce Grove, Red Deer, County of Flagstaff, and other infrequent occurrences of elevated arsenic have been noted, such as the P Picture Butte, Lethbridge area, Okotoks High River area, and Northern ben Medicine Hat. Here's, I'm just gonna let you take a little gander at this slide for a while. I, I won't talk too quickly. I'll try to ho hold myself back, but you can sort of see anything orange and red is above the guideline, and greens are below. So maybe you can see where you're situated on the map there. That's from Alberta Health and Wellness. Um, there is an online tool called AFIN, also from Alberta Health, that you can, if you just Google or do an internet search for the word AFIN, it should come up you know, among the first searches. Um, so Alberta Health has been collecting uh, trace metals samples for over a year now. And I, I, if I were you, I'd just sort of play around the tool and take a look at different parameters and see where, they're, with, where they end up. It's sort of interesting, but bear in mind that this is only over a year of data, so it's, it's not the whole picture by any means. Uh, so one of the treatments for arsenic is reverse osmosis. The majority of arsenic levels in the surveyed area are nearly the same before compared to af after treatment. So Treatment hasn't been that maybe well monitored, maybe well um, maintained, maybe well operated um, or selected. Um, and in a few cases, arsenic levels increased after treatment. This is perhaps when a system has been exhausted and should have been maintained earlier, or it's the wrong treatment system. Uh, reverse osmosis is a reliable method of treatment. Uh, Health Canada states that it can remove up to 85% with pretreatment. 
So pre-treatment includes oxidation, as I mentioned before, and if needed, sediment filtration, if there's enough particulate that may plug it, something else up that uh, like the reverse osmosis system, then um, you should filter that out before. And you need to monitor, monitor it and operate it correctly. Uh, so you can have a system to system program to uh, automatically shut down if the conductivity, which is a par parameter measured in water quality, um, if it exceeds 15% of the feed water. Uh, you can test it for manually as well as fairly simple, you know, test as long as you're familiar, become familiar with the method. Um, you can buy, you know, fairly inexpensive systems to do that. This is the point is to shut the system down before arsenic bypass occurs. So it's a safe level to shut it down at. Uh, I don't see a lot of systems in the local area for sale out now, but I hope they will come to market. Um, and you might be able to find some outside the area. Uh, so failure of the membrane is often a gradual process and can lead to the bypass of arsenic. So this is one way you can catch, you know, maybe when a membrane is failing. Distillation is another method. Um, it should remove virtually all arsenic from the water. Uh, but you have to ensure that your distiller is regularly cleaned and maintained. Also, there's a carbon filter that comes with your distiller. Uh, you remember to replace that regularly generally three months, because it not only catches vol volatile organic compounds, it may have a link to um, cancer, um, but it also can filter out bypass ar arsenic if it happens to occur, if there's a failure in the distiller or something. Though, though you don't want your distiller to be failing. Um, for larger systems, you can get iron-based absorptive media. Um, so you could pretreat with an oxidant such as chlorine or hydrogen peroxide, um, then you can use a bag filter to remove the precipitate or you can use absorptive media vessels so the precipitate adheres onto the, uh, the, the bead media and then you, you flush those out every so often and recharge the oxidant. Um, you can use iron enhanced activated alumina media um, you would need to adjust the pH with sulfuric acid, um, and then you can use chlorination and the media vessels I've talked about before with the bead media that adheres on the precipitate, adheres onto the beads, and then again, you need to back flush that. You should be aware of competing anions and dissolved silica um, because you may need to back flush more often uh, if these are present. Uranium is, uh, so arsenic, uh, you know, is a problem in the area as well as uranium. Um, the maximum acceptable concentration is 0 0.02 milligrams per liter. This was changed in 2001 from 0 0.1 milligram per liter, so five times. Um, and about 17% of samples exceed guidelines in the Bonneville area. That's from a 1999 study. Uh, the, uh, uranium is more prevalent in wells less than 30 meters deep, and even so, uh, more so in wells less than 15 meters deep. And it comes basically from minerals in the ground dissolved over long periods of time as the groundwater flows past the minerals. Um, so the treatment for uranium is uh, similar to um, for arsenic. Uh, at different pHs, different species of uranium carb carb uh, sorry, carbonates and hydroxides exist and do not filter out the same. Uh, reverse osmosis, similar to arsenic treatment, um, can be used. And you can, you know, use it as a point of use treatment under the sink for the drinking water. It's not going to affect you in the shower, along with arsenic. Uh, distillation, again, is a good system. Again, it needs to be properly cleaned and maintained. And it needs to be monitored to make sure the system is operating properly. That includes, um, depending on, you know, how things are going, uh, post-treatment water analysis to make sure it's operating properly. And that goes again for arsenic. Uh, how, uh, I was just wondering, how are we doing for time? I haven't noticed. Seven, oh, we're doing very good for time. <laughs> I, I'm surprised we're so far along. So I will have time for, uh, to get through the remaining slides and a good amount of time for questions as well. Doing much better than I thought. Okay, so, um, some, so I want to talk about groundwater under the direct influence um, of surface water and the treatment train principles regarding that. 
um, because if you have a shallow well, um, it may be susceptible to contamination. So I just want to back up a slide to make sure yeah, I didn't miss one. So uh, generally, um, deeper wells have a good clay barrier or another type of barrier from the surface, such as sandstone that is not permeable, that will protect the deeper wells from um, surface bacteria that shouldn't be in your well. And uh, some, however, some even some shallow wells can have a clay barrier that can protect them from the surface bacteria and microbiological organisms. Um, so in this in this case, uh, you need a more robust and capable system to deal with that. You know, and you can have variability. If you have higher levels of rainfall, you can have more biological organisms uh, getting into your well. And so it has to be robust enough to meet that variable water quality. Uh, you also have to monitor and maintain it more rigorously than um, you know a deeper well that's protected better. If you have a fair water quality, uh, you may be able to use various filters, such as particle filtration, that's a coarser filter, and then ultra filtration, which is a fine, it's sort of like reverse osmosis, but it's got larger pores. Um, but they're smaller than the particle filtration. And then a little finer pores than the ultrafiltration is the NF, which is nanofiltration. And then you can, once you take the bulk of your problems out of the water, then you can follow that up with reverse osmosis and ultraviolet um, uh, for drinking water. That's just to provide extra assurance and redundancy um, for treatment. And this is used, this is what we call a treatment train. It's used in municipal water treatment systems and it's just ensuring the safety of what you're drinking. Um, there used to be a system called mainstream. Uh, it's a tank coagulation with filtration. So they would use a coagulant to precipitate out um, your problem elements and uh, particles in the water. And uh, it was very robust. Unfortunately, I don't see it for sale this time. I think they didn't think it would, they were making enough, uh, you know, it was enough in business for them. So, but I'm hoping that that will come back um, in the future because it was a very capable and robust system and was actually used in surface water treatment uh, as long as it was operated correctly. Um, and, but you should follow that up with a reverse osmosis system if you did get a, a tank coagulation system. A system that uh, give some immediate feedback is preferred. Uh, it, this could be, well, one example was I measured a conductivity meter. You know, if it's at a certain percentage of the feed water, then, um, you know, it can maybe give you a warning light or shut the system down. Um, another example is a pressure indicator. So if the pressure is building up too high before the treatment system, such as a reverse osmosis treatment system, then um, it can give you, you know, a warning light or maybe even shut the system down if you have more serious elements such as arsenic that you don't, you want to be especially careful not to bypass the system. Uh, disinfection with chlorine, I just want to make a, a few comments about that. As I mentioned before, if you add chlorine with organics, you can create these disinfection byproducts that are in the long term could can cause, you know, cancer. and uh, um, so just be aware that in any, whenever you use chlorine, you should always keep that in mind. And, uh, but I want to mention that our reverse osmosis um, or activated carbon can remove these disinfection byproducts. Uh, the system should be monitored to make sure that it's uh, working. Like any system you have in general needs to be monitored. And uh, me membrane fil filter is often a better option for higher quality groundwater. So if you don't have sediment, man iron, manganese, or hardness, um, it's generally, uh, you know, a, a, you, it's a, can be a standalone system. And sometimes you might want to, even if you have pretreatment, you might want to think about a uh, better option, even if you're trying to pretreat the sediment, manganese, or hardness. As far as general tips on system selection goes, uh, you should you know, do some research to find out the time and knowledge required for you to operate the system. Some people get a system and then they don't realize all what's involved and then they end up regretting the system. Uh, I mean, you can get, 
you know, the dealers to um, operate it and maintain it for you. And this often does occur in, in some treatment system, uh, systems, especially the more complicated ones. You need to consider the flow rate and your daily needs. You should do some calculations ahead of time. Um, uh, you know, just so you, you and, and determine can your well produce what you need to, um, to use and to backwash. Um, and uh, pressure requirements for reverse osmosis filters uh, should also, and backwash systems should also be required. You may need a booster pump, for example. You may need to, yeah, so you may need to also repressurize the water, not just to provide higher flow from a cistern, but to bump up the pressure. And you should also an, uh, consider the footprint for it, the physical space required for the system. As far as maintenance and operation goes, some chemicals are more dangerous to use. So, you know, it, it may require um, handling and service by the contractor or the dealer. Uh, troubleshooting is, uh, I find it a fascinating subject. There are many things that one can say about troubleshooting. Um, as long as I'm here, you can phone me for assistance, but that's a whole nother seminar and uh, um, I enjoy doing it though. Uh, but you need also, you need to consider the whole water analysis when you're selecting a treatment system uh, because, you know, and, and I'd say this before any questions come because, um, but we probably have enough time and as there's not as many participants. So, um, I was going to say that, uh, you know, I may not be able to provide, I may not be able to look at all the parameters if you ask about your specific water, um, because it requires a lot of questions and knowing each of the problematic um, uh, elements or each parameter level, because even if you only want to treat for one problem parameter, there are other parameters that may throw a wrench into the treatment system. So you need to look at the whole water analysis. Um, and some of the common troubles are, th these are very common troubles um, in, in a lot of water treatment systems, fouling. That's a major ongoing problem. So you do need to have a regimen to replace, say, membranes or, or re uh, recharge the media, or, or even maybe sometimes after a longer period of time, replace the, the media. And uh, that goes more often for filters. And choosing the wrong system has, unfortunately, as I mentioned before, been quite a you know, common problem. And that I finished uh, earlier than, um, is anyone gonna complain that I finished earlier? Anyways, uh, I guess we have more time for questions and we may be able to leave earlier. Are you on mute, Kelly? Uh, yeah, I was muted. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I guess one question that I had was like, how much of the iron you need to remove for reverse osmosis? Uh, you, I mean, I would say below 0.1 milligram per liter. You should, you know, essentially get rid of all of it. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to get rid of all of it if you use the proper method. But yeah, you want a low, low, you know, I'd say below 0.1 milligram per liter. You can live with a little bit of, you know, this or that, but uh, it's not preferred. You just have to replace your membrane more often. Okay. Um, does anybody else have questions? Um, I asked for it to be in chat, but we're a very small group. I could unmute everybody. I thought I saw an earlier question in the chat. I can't see the chat now. Boys. Oh yeah. Okay. That was yes. That was your question. Okay. <laughs> Scott, did you have a question? Uh, no. I just pressed the wrong button. Beg your pardon. Oh, all right. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. Can I ask a question? Uh, of course you can. Um, did I understand? you to say that uh, Alberta Health is now testing for arsenic when you send in a regular water test? That's right. They're tracing, uh, testing for the trace metals. Um, so that includes not only arsenic, but fluoride, um, lead, other important parameters, but also uh, other parameters that exist that are maybe not as 
you know, harmful as arsenic or lead. Yeah. Well, that's good because we took part in uh, a study they did quite a few years ago and we found out that our well does have arsenic in it. Mm -hmm. But we also found out that when it comes out of our tap, the arsenic was gone. So we were kind of happy to hear that. That's great. Yeah, that the study you're referring to was done in 2012. Um, they tested hundreds of, well, uh, hundreds of wells out here and about 50% uh, had higher than acceptable concentrations that they found. I hope there's no arsenic precipitating within your uh, distribution system, you know, after it's coming out of the tap, because if there's some leaching, point of leaching, it, uh, well, for a short term, some arsenic may come out, but, but that's not, do you know what the level is, if I may ask, or the raw water was? It was just over the allowable limit. I'd oh, okay, have to look okay. at the test, but. Yeah, probably not that bad. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions regarding, you can ask about your own treatment train or um, anything that you'd be thinking about setting up, or if you have a water test handy, if you have anything that you'd like to note about, feel free. We have the time. <laughs> oh, yep, yeah, Scott, I can. Um. I came in late to the meeting, I'm sorry about that. Um, can, where can I get one of these water tests? So is it for household usage? Yeah. yeah. You can go to your local health unit. Um, they don't charge for the testing. Kelly, do you know if they charge for a courier fee? Uh, they charge a courier fee. I think it's under $20 for it. Um, yeah, yeah, you can go to your local health unit. So if you're oh, oh. Bonneville or St. Paul or anywhere, and um, just make mention that you'd like to get heavy metals tested, because I think it oh. is a different bottle set that they give. They do it automatically now. Okay. Perfect. And if it's for other non-household use, usage, just, I mean, I don't know if there's any farmers here, but um, you, you, you would have, if, if it's for agriculture, you'd have to go to a private lab, just to mention. Yeah, just household, thanks. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And just a note, um, when you do take your test, they'll give you two bottles. They'll give you a bacteria one that you can take from your tap at your kitchen. Um, and then the other one should be done before your treatment system. Okay, perfect. And make sure you follow the instructions to the T and dot the I's we'll, as well. <laughs> we'll do. We'll it's do. important. Yeah, okay. And stick your perfect. stickers on because <laughs> they're pretty sticky. Thank both. you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. I guess the other thing to mention if you are submitting your samples, uh, most health units take them on Mondays and Tuesdays. Um, so you can get your bottles anytime, um, but you have to grab your water samples like the morning of or as close to as when you're gonna deliver them. And I think they're usually before noon that you have to drop them off. So is that's that, in mind. Is, is that in the provincial building there? Or I, I'm not familiar. Um, health units are located in different places. In Bonneville, it's right in the provincial building. Um, in St. Paul, it's on the west end of town. Um, I'm not sure where Elk Points is, um, but um, they're usually fairly easy to find. Yeah. All right. Do you mind if I ask a, a question? No, go ahead. Some, may, maybe someone wants to ask a question. But, um, I, I was just wondering, does anyone want to share what problems they have themselves with water quality? I heard arsenic at one, one point. That's okay. You don't have to say anything. Um, as well as the arsenic, we have a very high iron level. So we use a chlorination system with a tank, settling tank and okay. water softener and reverse osmosis. So it covers pretty well everything. Okay, you got the whole gamut. Is there a reason you use reverse osmosis? Is there something else in the water that you want to remove? Uh, well, the reverse osmosis 
like after it comes out of the softener, it, it doesn't oh, taste yeah. that great. The salt, <laughs> the salt. Yeah, the salt from the softener. Yeah. So, so your settling tank, chlorine settling tank, didn't remove enough, so you had to follow it up with the. Or you, is that the reason you followed up with the softener, or, or did you have hardness? Oh, everything. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, something you can spray on your enemies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it clogs the pipes and. Yeah, yeah. The horses don't really like it, but they will drink. So you have hardness, right? Yeah, I imagine yep. the raw. Yeah, okay. Yep. <laughs> Heard that before. Raw water. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can uh, show you a picture. I don't know how well it's going to come up, but that's uh, my pump that we pulled this year. Oops. It went. Um, there. Yeah, I'd like to take. Oh, nice. So and, and is there, my pump is that, that just. Out of our well, that's just iron. It just uh, looks like scaling. Is there a bio slime? Oh, I can't tell. No, it's mostly scaling. Yeah, so yeah. It was, um, kind of see it yeah, there. yeah, that's it's, um, pretty. So, yeah, yeah, pretty high level. Iron is definitely a big problem in this area. Well, I'll keep that in mind. Like, uh, yeah, I've been interesting here to some of the levels. I don't know if anyone knows the levels that. Do you know your level of iron, Kelly? Uh, I should have found it beforehand. I had, can't find my water test results, but <laughs> yeah, it's very high. <laughs> yeah, I've heard up to. I mean, even over thirty milligrams per liter, which is ridiculous. I mean, people try to case past those, but sometimes you gotta live with what you have. Mm -hmm. Very good. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to share? You might have to unmute yourselves, but. You must have covered it really well, Sean. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I didn't re next time I'm going to add more information because I didn't realize I would finish so early. So uh, I'll let them off easy this time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought it would be over. Yeah. Well, if anybody ever has questions, um, you can always follow up. I still have some of the old egg dexes on iron and arsenic and different things that way. So um, I do have more information or I can always get you in touch with Sean as well. Um, so yeah, so feel free to contact myself at Lara anytime. So other than that, I will thank you very much, Sean, for uh, presenting tonight. And thank you guys for participating. And I guess we can end there and have a good night. Thank you. And thank you for hosting, Kelly. You're welcome.